In the last three lectures that I've given, um, I've done some rigorous mathematics, at least rigorous by my standards. Uh, we first studied the sitter space, solutions of Einstein equations, figured out what the uh, slicing was, what the various coordinate systems were. And I gave a lecture on eternal inflation as seen through a simple model, a lattice model, that we sometimes call the Mandelbrot model. The mathematics of that is quite rigorous. In fact, it was done by real mathematicians. It can be generalized. You don't have to think about it on a lattice. You can think about it, uh, you know, without a lattice. And the theorems are the same. Yesterday, I talked about Coleman de Lucha instantons. Basically, again, pretty rigorous, although there is a little bit of a logical gap that personally I've never completely understood. We're just talking about it with one of the students now. That's the selection of the contour of integration. Uh, but that's OK. Somebody else understands it. I'm not sure who. Anybody here understand it? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Daniel Harlow understands it. And it's OK because he's my student, so it's. Just to clarify the question. Yeah, Ed, Edward understands it. What? 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 The question is how to evaluate conversion to pairhood. Yes. Yeah. 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 But the. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that was what the question was about. Adam asked the question, and uh, this gentleman here asked the question. And um, I said, why don't you, I'll defer it to my assistant over here. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not talking about Edward. I'm talking about, uh, my, uh, what's his name? <laughs> anyway, I've done things pretty reasonably rigorously. Today, we're going to jump into some deeply, deeply speculative waters. That's another reason I wore my shorts today. The so-called measure problem. Now, the measure problem is very, very poorly understood, but it's extremely important. Without getting it right, without getting the logic of it right, this business can never be made into real science. Uh, my own opinion is this business of eternal inflation will be made or broken by whether or not we can put in place a reasonable, coherent, logic of probabilities or a coherent framework for the theory, a coherent logical framework for the theory, and not whether we can uh, build uh, some sort of string-inspired models for it and so forth. I think it's a logic which is going to make or break it, and we will see. At the moment, the logic of it is ex as, as an incredible mess. And I'm going to point out some of the messy features of it. What it really needs is a good janitor to clean it up. Is my janitor here? No, not, no, 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 I'm talking about Nadi. Nadi refers to himself as the janitor because he's always cleaning up uh, other people's messes. OK. In any case, that's where we're going to go. Now, the measure problem is a problem of probabilities. How do you define a coherent set of probabilities for the landscape or whatever we want to call it? But it's also a class of problems which I call the who am I problems. Uh, you wake up in the morning and you don't know what, uh, what your nationality is, and so what is your best guess? Well, your best guess is you're Chinese because there are more Chinese than anybody else. That kind of problem. Uh, <laughs> That, that, that's the kind of problem that we're facing. We have woken up on a planet, and we're trying to figure out who we are in the sense of what part of the multiverse are we in, uh, and, and trying to make statistical predictions for the future, and also trying to make statistical explanations of why the things we see are the way they are. So uh, neither I nor anybody else that I know has formalized the logic of probability theory in this kind of context. And I'm not going to do that now in any case. But instead, I think it's helpful to rely on analogies and metaphors to explain to you what the problem is. So let me begin 
by thinking about an analogous problem. Now, it's a, it's a made-up problem. It's a Gedanken universe, and, uh, but uh, I think it makes some logical sense. Maybe not physical sense, but logical sense. Uh, we live in a universe in which there are only two kinds of planets, big planets and little planets. The universe is filled up with these planets, big ones, and the big ones are big enough, there are only two kinds, and there are, there's none in between, and the big ones are big enough to be able to contain something like 10 to the ninth people or observers at any given time, and the little ones, they're smaller, and they can only have a million people. Let's not uh, write in the number. Let's give them names, big ones and little ones. And the universe is filled up with them. And let's suppose that a good theory of the universe made by, oh, OK. Here's, uh, here's one of the particular planets. And this particular planet is a city called Eos. It's a small city. I-A-S, and in the city of E-S, there are some very, very smart people, and these very, very smart people have figured out some stuff about the universe, or at least their speculative theories, theories based on good logic, uh, but still a little bit speculative, have told them that the planet equations have only two solutions, big ones and little ones, with a billion observers and million observers each, and furthermore, their cosmological equations tell them that the universe is filled up with these more or less at random uh, equal a priori numbers of bigs and littles. And now the question is, the people who live in EAS are planning a excursion around their planet to find out how big it is. They don't know whether they live on a big planet or a little planet. And they're making their bets. They're trying to make their scientific predictions. Should they predict 50% because there's equal numbers of large planets and small planets? Or should they weigh their probabilities by the number of observers? Namely, to say that there's a 1,000 times more probability that they live on a large planet than a small planet. You can think of reasons for either of these uh, conclusions. The 50% is obvious. There are as many uh, big planets as little planets. And so I choose 50%. On the other hand, if we divided all of the observers in all planets in half and had half of them bet that they were on big planets, whether they were on little planets or big planets, half of them bet that they were on big planets, and half of them bet that they were on little planets, there would be a lot more winners among those who bet that they were on big planets. So you might say, just counting the number of winners, I want to be a winner. I'll bet with uh, those who are going to be the winners. I'll bet that there's a 1,000 times more probability that I'm on a big planet. This is a very confusing situation. They ask the physicists. And the physicists tell them what I think is an important lesson. They say, look. I can't tell you how to bet. Betting is a psychological thing. You decide how you're going to bet. I will tell you the facts. The fact is that there are more or less an equal number of planets out there of big and little kind, and the big ones have 10 to the ninth, and the little ones have 10 to the sixth. That's what I'll tell you. You decide how to bet. And that's the kind of situation we're in. Um, now, the pattern could be a little bit complex. It could be that, uh, that the rules, the statistical rules for laying down these planets are a little bit complicated. And you might want to make a fairly precise definition of the counting of the number of observers of each kind. So one way, oh, incidentally, in this model, I'm going to assume the universe is infinite. So there's an infinite number of every kind. And therefore, strictly speaking, the ratio of the number of bigs to littles is infinity over infinity, not completely well defined. And so we have to regulate the problem first. In order to make sense out of the statistics, the mathematicians will come and 
tell us, cut the thing off, make a big region of space, count in that region of space. Use your theory. I mean, you, you, you can go out on rocket ships and count, but if you have a statistical theory, you can do the statistics of this and count the average number of bigs and littles. And when I say bigs and littles, I now mean number of observers in each. Count them according to your theory, and then take the limit as n goes to infinity. That's your answer, okay? Now, does the limit exist? Well, you could imagine a little bit of a problem. Uh, your geometry, what, what, what shape should you make for your cutoff as you let it get bigger and bigger? The obvious thing is to take a big sphere and let the sphere get bigger and bigger. But supposing the geometry of space depends on the presence of these masses, as of course it does, then you might find that, uh, that there might be a tendency that whatever prescription, whatever geometric prescription you write down might tend to miss big planets somewhat, a little bit. Here, in the, out near the edge, it might tend to pick up small planets and push away uh, big planets, or vice versa. Is that a problem? Well, it, of course, it could be a, it could be a, uh, a real serious effect, but you can imagine a wide class of effects like this that you would call edge effects. And the edge effects ordinarily would not be a big problem. Why? Because the surface to volume ratio goes to zero as the system gets bigger and bigger. So if we're talking about an edge effect, if we're talking about something having to do with the specific way that we draw these surfaces, and it really is only um, important out near the edges, then we would say because the surface to volume ratio goes to zero, this ratio here will not depend on the particular way that we define our uh, cutoff. Yes, yes. Uh. Yes, 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 yes. These are two separate problems. These are two separate problems, or at least I think they're separate problems. Uh, these are two separate problems. And so surface to volume allows you to, uh, to dismiss this problem as not unimportant. But if it was our universe, and we really do happen to live as uh, eternal inflators think we do, I mean, just our ordinary universe, if uh, the geometry is hyperbolic, then what it looks like is this. Here's you at the center. There's a great big mathematical disk. And as you go out, you discover you're in a negatively curved hyperbolic plane. And the interesting fact about the hyperbolic plane is that surface area grows exactly the same way as volume. In fact, what you can say is the volume or the surface out to a radius r grows, proper radius r, grows exponentially with r, and therefore the integrals of counting up things on the interior are dominated, or at least you get a finite contribution, a finite fraction of a contribution of things near the edge. And that can really screw up your counting if your counting has some kind of bias uh, that would tend to make it, for example, avoid big planets and not avoid small planets. This is the problem of exponential growth of populations. In this case, it's exponential growth with, with uh, distance. In the case of eternal inflation, it's exponential growth with, uh, with time. This is what makes it hard to count. It not only makes it hard to count, it's not entirely clear that there are well-defined rules. In fact, <laughs> stronger than that, it's very, very uh, unclear that there are any kind of well-defined rules. So that's what we're going to get into today. So before I do, let me just, uh, we're going to do this in a kind of cartoon version. I'm going to describe the various kinds of measures that people have studied, the motivations for them, and uh, to some extent how they work, but I'm going to do it in a very simplified context, which is very easy to understand, 
we don't have to do very complicated calculations. Let me begin with the iconic picture of the multiverse. Here's the iconic picture. Everybody who does eternal inflation draws this picture. And so forth and so on. And the important thing about it is that the population of every kind of thing, every kind of thing which can happen, does happen, and as Alan Guth says, everything that can happen does happen in the multiverse and happens an infinite number of times. And this picture looks reminiscent of the hyperbolic plane. It is very similar to the hyperbolic plane. It is the hyperbolic plane. And um, what we have to do is somehow, in order to regulate the infinities, if we want to calculate relative probabilities and we try to count everything, we get infinite over infinite. Uh, if we regulate the infinities, we're in danger of regulating them in ways where edge effects are important and dominate the answers, even though we don't really want them to. Uh, in other words, the answers could well depend on the specific regulator choice that you do, that you use. A regulator, for me, will mean today a way of cutting off late times, drawing a surface through it. Now, I, I have no idea if this is the right thing to do. I'm not even advocating it. I'm reporting. I'm reporting on ideas that have been uh, in the literature. Drawing a surface through here, counting whatever it is you want to count, observers of various kinds, perhaps observers conditioned on which kind of uh, vacuum they're in, count them, take ratios, and then push the cutoff up to infinity. And the problem is the problem of exponential growth always winds up making it sensitive to the cutoff procedure. Okay, before I, uh, before I start doing some counting, and I'm gonna do the counting by a trick, a very simple trick, which winds up giving the same answers that everybody else gets, but uh, it makes it easy to do in 15 minutes instead of an hour and a half. Okay, I'm going to redraw this diagram. This diagram here has been drawn using conformal time. That's why the light cones are at 45 degrees. So this is actually conformal time runs downward. T increases downward. I'm going to use proper time. And I'm gonna make a cartoon of the situation here. Uh, the geometry has been studied in some detail and the result is pretty much indistinguishable from the following simple recipe. Replace every kind, every bubble, by what I'll call a square bubble. Well, before we make it a square bubble, uh, it would look something like this. Here's a bubble. We're using the same x-coordinate, incidentally, the same x-coordinate that I used over here. Now t equals infinity will be up at the top of the blackboard. In fact, it doesn't even end. It just goes up to infinity. But I'm not tall enough to draw it up to infinity. Um, that's a bubble. Notice that the bubble asymptotically at late times has a fixed coordinate separation. Of course, that doesn't mean it has a fixed size. The size grows. But the coordinate uh, separation goes to a constant. And therefore, these edges of the bubble here will be parallel vertical lines. There are observers in here. I'm going to take this picture and simplify it. And I'm going to just replace it by a piece, well, an infinite rectangle, and I'm going to put the observers in at a specific time. Now, the idea is, the first idea is, that in any given cosmological bubble like this, there's a characteristic time. Assume that there is a characteristic time. It might be spread over 10, 20, 30, 40 billion years, but still, there's a band of times in which observations can be made. Make that assumption that observations cannot be made in the infinite remote past, they can't be made too early, there's nobody there, and that there's a natural band, and that band of observation occurs 
at a proper time T naught after the bubble nucleation. For us, it's a few billion, well, 10 billion years, roughly. You could say it's the time that it takes to evolve a, uh, an intelligent enough person to ask the question. Okay, so this is some T naught, and for our world, it's of order 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th years. And we'll erase this more complicated picture. We'll retain the square bubble approximation. And of course, we have lots of square bubbles. Bubbles that occur late look smaller or narrower. Bubbles can occur inside bubbles. If they occur very late, they look so thin we hardly see them on the blackboard. There are lots of them, infinitely many of them. In fact, infinitely many of them in any coordinate patch, but most of them are later and later, okay? So in order to give an answer to the question, the relative number of observers in vacuum of type one versus type two, we have to regulate it. We have to draw some kind of regulator surface and then count everything below the regulator surface, take ratios, and then let the regulator surface go up to infinity. Okay, so here's the way that I will count. And I assure you, it is equivalent to the, uh, to the more complicated ways that people count. It's equivalent as long as the bubble density is low. In other words, as long as the nucleation probability is small. For sm small nucleation probability, you can say, well, let's, some background, let's start with some background, let's call it the ancestor vacuum. We'll assume the ancestor vacuum can decay to various kinds of bubbles. We'll start with an ancestor with no bubble in it. The, this is not a bubble in the, let's cut it off, or is it? And introduce a cutoff surface. Now, what the exact definition of this cutoff surface is not too important, but I'm going to assume it's a horizontal line in the sitter space, right? A horizontal line in the de Sitter background. And since the sitter space is time translation invariant, I can pick it, well, without any loss of generality, I can pick the cutoff surface to be at t equals zero. Now, t equals zero does not mean the beginning of the de Sitter space. It means an arbitrary time and you can think of it as being an arbitrary time in the flat slicing or equivalently a late time in, uh, in the global slicing. But I'm just labeling it t equals zero for convenience. And now let's throw a bubble into it. Here's a bubble that's thrown into it. But because the bubble affects the geometry, I don't really offhand know how I should extend the cutoff surface into the, into the bubble. I have to make up a rule. There are all kinds of rules that I could make. All right, so let's, uh, let's put some notation on here. Let's call the time at which the bubble nucleates, which will be negative because it's supposed to occur before the cutoff. T nucleation, that's the time, proper time at which the bubble nucleates. The time that it takes to make observers, uh, this is my symbol for observers. The time that it takes to make them is called T observer. As I said, this is the number which is 10 billion, light, uh, 10 billion years, not 10, 10 billion light years. Let's say that the Hubble constant in the outer vacuum here is called H, and the Hubble constant in the bubble is called little h. Little h assume is smaller than big H. This is t equals zero, that's uh, to t nucleation. I think I've got everything on this picture that I need. Right. We're gonna study the measure. We're gonna try to define a measure as a function of little h and maybe also t zero. You'll see why it's interesting to think of it as also a function of t zero. And the other thing we can throw in is the number of e-foldings of slow roll inflation. But for the moment, I'm ignoring completely slow roll inflation in the early universe. Let's just forget that for the time being. We'll put that back later. You will put that back later, not me. Okay, so here's our setup. 
The only unknown thing is how to extend the cutoff into the interior. Now remember that vertical here means proper time. Okay, here is what the measure is going to be. With some definition of where the cutoff surface is, I will require in the counting, in counting observers, that the observers occur before the cutoff, whatever the definition of the cutoff is. With that restriction, I will then integrate over all space and all time below the cutoff the nucleation point. I will calculate the space-time volume available to the nucleation point here, given the constraint that the observers are before the cutoff. In other words, I will calculate integral d, let's call it a dt nucleation, capital N and small n are the same thing here, dt nucleation, dx nucleation, times square root of g, where square root of g is the metric in the background in which the bubble nucleates. All right. Now, I know what the square root of g is in the sitter space. It's just e to the 3 h tn. This is just the exponential expansion of the scale factor. So I want to calculate this integral, and I want to calculate it from the remote past. Uh, the past is not, is not uh, going to be important here. But we're going to want to integrate it right up to the point where the observers pass through the cutoff surface, which has not yet been specified. So there's a cutoff on this integral here. I'll, inter I'll indicate the cutoff by just drawing a slash through here, that you cut off the integral when Tn is such that the observer band passes through the cutoff. So what do we need now? We need a rule for how the cutoff surface extends. Oh, boy. Let's see. How do we get this thing down? Oh, we have another one. No, that's the one I used. Ah, here we have. Well, why am I doing this? Here we are. No, I lost my picture. Yeah. I don't want it down. I want it up. Yeah, but then I have to use the eraser. I was hoping that there was some magical mathematical way to do this. Right. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Witten's working on it. All right, so here is my first proposal. This is not, none of this is mine, incidentally. All of this has been um, foisted upon us by other people. I will tell you who some of the people are as we go along. All right, the first procedure is called proper time cutoff, and it's very simple. It just says, uh, incidentally, vertical t is proper time. You could ask proper time in what coordinates? Proper time in string frame, proper time in this frame, proper time in that frame. Let's fix it by saying uh, in uh, Planck units. OK, so here's our proper time. Here's our setup. Cut off over here. We stick the bubble in. Incidentally, for simplicity, I'm going to assume the size of the bubble when it nucleates, proper size of the bubble, when it nucleates is fixed, and I'll just call it 1. I won't bother putting in a parameter describing the size of the bubble. We could call it v naught, but uh, let's just call it 1. And my first rule is proper time cutoff, which means that the cutoff just goes right through there. It just passes right through, same proper time, and we count observers if they're before there, and we don't count them if they're after. If they're after. Here's T nucleation. And what is the constraint? Let's see, this is T naught. T naught, this is T equals zero. This has Hubble constant H, and this has Hubble constant big H. Okay. We want to do that integral up there. And what is the cutoff? The cutoff is when T nucleation plus T naught 
equals T0, uh, sorry, equals zero. So we want T nucleation plus T naught to be less than zero, and that puts the observers below the cutoff. Or equivalently, T nucleation less than minus T0. All we have to do now is that integral, oh, incidentally, the space part of the integral, um, we can just, if we, if we did this in the global slicing, then the space part of the integral would just give us some number. The number would be the same number uh, for any vacuum. And so the space part of the integral factors off. We're not interested in the space part of the integral. The time part of the integral is just integral dTn e to the 3htn from minus infinity or from wherever we start up to minus t naught. And that's an easy integral to calculate. It's 1 over 3h e to the minus 3h t naught. Now, I failed to tell you about a factor of h which appears. The factor of h which appears has to do with the prior assumption about the distribution of vacuums in the landscape. If we assume that, uh, that the prior distribution of vacuums with very small cosmological constant is flat for very small cosmological constant, since h, the h's uh, are square roots of the cosmological constant, in the measure, there's a natural h here, which uh, is just the conversion from uniform measure in cosmological constant to a extra factor of h there. Okay. All right, so that's, uh, that's uh, every place, in every integral, there should be a factor of little h on the outside. But it, it's not a an especially important thing. All right. Let's look at this now. This is supposed to be the measure or the counting of observers as a function of h given the time that it takes to make an observer. Now let's suppose that the time that it takes to make an observer is not strongly dependent, is very, very weakly, hardly dependent at all on h. Then t naught is independent of h. This is going in the wrong direction. The measure is getting bigger as h gets large, we want to understand why, we want to understand a probabilistic argument why little h is very small. This is not good. You can think of it another way. You can think of it as a probability measure for how long it takes to make observers. Now, what does that mean? If we're given uh, chemistry and a given biology, it might take a long time to make observers or it might take a short time. How can it take a short time? It could take a short time if a bunch of accidents happened during evolution which favored rapid evolution. A bunch of statistically unlikely things. Maybe you can push the, um, the time scale for evolution down by a factor of a year or 10 years or something by having a sequence of unlikely uh, events take place. So you can also think of this as a measure on, uh, on T naught. Notice this factor here does not depend on little h. The dependence on little h is very weak, but it has a radically strong dependence on T naught. Why is that? Because one assumes that the ancestor vacuum has a large Hubble constant. The ancestor vacuum presumably has a Hubble constant larger than the energy density during slow roll inflation or whatever, it could be 10 to the 35 in, uh, in Planck units, or oh, sorry, 10 to the 35 inverse uh, seconds, capital H. And what would this say? This would be a unbelievably strong pressure to make T naught as small as possible. If H naught were, what did I say, 10 to the 35 or something? e to the minus 3 times 10 to the 35 t naught is an incredible pressure. You get a huge factor in probability if you just push forward the, um, the evolution scale by one second. A ridiculously large, this is called the youngness problem, that this measure strongly, strongly favors 
worlds where evolution takes place at an unnaturally rapid rate. That's one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is it's just a failure. If you think of T0 as fixed, it simply doesn't tell you why little h is small. This proper time measure is one that deserves uh, to be uh, dismissed, but on phenomenological grounds. No clear argument about why we're dismissing it from a logical point of view, just it's phenomenologically a disaster. OK, let's try another game. What's that? Change the, the prior for h. Sure, you could change the prior for h by saying that there's an enormous number of vacuums of very small cosmological constant. But, you know, that's defeating the, that, that's defeating the whole purpose of this. Uh, the point was to assume a natural distribution of vacuums. Zero cosmological constant, according to standard logic, is not special. And so I think it makes a good deal of sense uh, to say that the prior distribution of energy levels is uniform for very, very tiny uh, cosmological constant. But yes, of course you could, uh, if it turns out that the landscape is such that there's a huge overwhelming abundance of vacuums at small cosmological constant for reasons that are totally unknown, then who needs eternal inflation? Who needs the anthropic principle? That's it, we're finished. OK, but uh, let's not go that route. We're going to go another route and try other kinds of measures, other kinds of assumptions for measures. All right, so here's a game. The other measures which have been studied in recent years all fall into a category whose logic, actually the logic was spelled out, I think, most clearly by Douglas Stanford, who's here a couple of years ago, uh, explained to me and to Steve Schenker and I'm pretty much just describing that logic. I, I give it a name. I call it the take-out, put-back logic. Take-out, put-back. Again, do not ask me what the logic is that tells you that this is the thing to do. What I'm simply doing is putting in a very simple language what the, some of the various cutoffs that have been, that have been studied. All right. The takeout putback logic says that there is an extensive quantity on the cutoff surface. Extensive means it's an integral over space. What that quantity is will determine which kind of cutoff we're using. Let's call it Q. Extensive, as I said, means it's proportional to the volume, but possibly volume times something else. Uh, and when you put a bubble in, it removes or it excises, it just bites out a certain amount of Q. Your rule, or my rule, is to say whatever you took out from here, when you stuck the bubble in, put it back inside the bubble. That may require you to shift the cutoff time. Q on, the, the missing Q over here is put back, if necessary, by shifting the cutoff surface. So I will do a little calculation for you where Q is equal to volume. The volume that you excise, you put back. Okay, so let's go through the, let's go through the calculation. I think I can do it on half a blackboard here. Let's first calculate the volume that's been excised, the volume, the takeout volume, let's call it, VTO, the takeout volume is the volume that would be here if the bubble weren't here. Okay. Assume that the bubble that nucleates nucleates with a proper volume equal to one. That's not important. The proper volume of the bu of bubble when it nucleates is, um, uh, scales out of the problem altogether. So what's the volume? that would be there on this surface if the bubble weren't there? The answer is E to the 3H T nucleation with a minus sign. It's minus because T nucleation is always negative. The deeper T nucleation is, the more time, the more expansion that's taken place if the bubble weren't here. 
So we start with a bubble with a given proper size, and we ask how big will that bubble be by the time we get to the cutoff surface, and the answer is e to the minus 3 htn. That's where I've used the fact that the cutoff surface is at zero. Okay, what's the putback volume? The putback volume, you start with that unit volume, but you let it evolve inside the bubble up until, let's call it T prime. T prime is the new cutoff position. The cutoff inside the bubble, we'll call it T prime. We allow the volume to expand inside the bubble until the volume in here is the same as the amount we took out. Okay, so what does that give us? That gives us E to the three T prime minus T nucleation. The amount of time, oh, sorry, small h. Inside the bubble, this, the, uh, the Hubble expansion is with small h, so it's E to the three h, little h, times T prime minus T nucleation. Now let's set them equal. We set these two equal. That says that, t, uh, that says that big H times Tn is equal to little h times T prime minus Tn, and we solve that for T prime. That tells us where the cutoff surface is. Okay, so we solve that for T prime. Let me see if I have it written down here. Uh, T prime is equal to little h minus big H over little h times Tn, times the nucleation time. All right, so that's the first thing we find. The next thing we want to say is that in the integral, we want the observers to be before the cutoff. So that translates into the statement that Tn plus T naught, Tn plus T naught should be less than T prime. And then plugging in for T prime here, it eventually tells us, eventually gives us the cutoff. The cutoff is at Tn less than minus little h over big H times T naught. Okay, so you see the logic? We use the take out put back rule to tell us where to put the cutoff. And then we say that, uh, that the integration over T nucleation should satisfy the constraint, the cutoff, that T nucleation is less than or equal or less than uh, little h over big H. Okay, now we can do the integral. Remember what the integral was. The integral was just integral d, uh, dx, but that factors out. No dependence in the x integration. The Tn, e to the minus 3 h Tn, e to the plus 3 h Tn, e to the plus 3 h Tn, and there's an extra factor of h out here, uh, which came from uh, the, the prior. But it is now integrated up to here. So what are we going to get? We're going to get, again, h over 3 capital H, but then e to the minus, the minus comes from the minus over here in the cutoff, big H times little h over big H is just little h times T naught. This is the measure, everybody follow that? Three. e to the minus 3 H now we're in much better shape. Look what it says. If I look at this, forget the big H here. That's not important. What I'm doing is comparing different vacuums with different little h. Big H is basically scaled out. In studying the probability distribution or the counting observer of observers when the Hubble constant in their patch is little h, the important thing is the little h dependence. And here it is. Where is it going to be concentrated? It's going to be concentrated when little h times t naught is of order 1. Little h times t naught of order 1. 
Now, I, I should tell you right now, in the literature, I can't tr seem to track. There's another factor of H uh, that I, I, I haven't been able to figure out yet where it comes from. Um, it seems people tend to agree that there's another factor of H. As I said, I don't know where it comes from, but uh, it may have something to do with the, uh, with the square bubble approximation. I'm not sure. It doesn't make much difference. It hardly makes any difference at all. But if you were to plot the probability distribution as a function of h, well, it goes to 0 at h equals 0, and then it rises, and then it goes exponentially to 0 like that. And where is it concentrated? It's concentrated when little h is of order the inverse of the time that it takes to make somebody. That's, of course, the coincidence problem. It's a coincidence problem. The coincidence problem is the fact that our present age of the universe, t naught, the time that it took to make us, is to within a factor of two, I think, uh, the inverse of the Hubble expansion associated with the cosmological constant. So this theory seems to have an explanation. Notice that no place that I use Weinberg's assumption of structure formation and so forth, all I did was a little bit of geometry and counting and found that, that little h should be inverse to the, uh, to the age at which the observation is made. What it says is remarkable. It says that anywheres in the landscape or anywheres in the multiverse, whatever, uh, whatever's going on, whatever the physics is, whatever the Hubble constants are, in most places in the landscape, observations take place at a time which is inverse to the, uh, to the Hubble expansion rate, to the, to the cosmological constant. Now, there's all sorts of details, all sorts of details that people worry about, um, star formation, all sorts of stuff. I don't want to get into that. The logic here is what I want to aim at. Okay. So this is a great triumph until we start looking at it more closely. Are there other cues that we could use? Yes, there are other cues we can use, and I'll give you one that I like very much. I like it better than uh, volume. I don't like volume very much. The reason I don't like volume very much is because you could ask volume in what units? String units, Einstein units, and volume measured in, um, and volume measured in Planck units is a funny quantity. Whatever Planck is, it's an area. It's not a volume. And uh, volume measured in Planck units seems to me a little strange. But never mind. Is there another reasonable um, Q? Is there other forms of Q? So let me go back to one that I like a lot. It's called the light cone time. It's called light cone time. It was pioneered by, uh, by uh, the Berkeley group, whose names I can't remember. Busso, Freivogel, or I, can't, I, I, I better back off because I'll get the names wrong. Uh, and it's called, as I said, light cone time. It has nothing to do with light cone frames, incidentally. Nothing to do with light cone frames. Uh, but you can think of it if you go back to these Mandelbrot type replication models that divide up space and keep dividing up space and so forth. Every little box at any time when you've broken it up into little boxes after n units of time, each box represents a Hubble volume or the volume of a causal patch. That means that when the volumes break up, it's not the volume which is, uh, which is growing exponentially. It's the number of Hubble patches. Why are they different? because you could have different Hubble constants in different patches. So a very natural quantity, and in fact, the time variable that appears in the Mandelbrot model here is not scale factor time. It's not proper time. It is time which is counting the number of Hubble patches present. It's called light cone time. But I'll define it for you another way, which is uh, useful to, uh, well, I'll define it in terms of the cutoff procedure. It corresponds to using a Q. I think we can leave this 
I think we can basically leave this up here and just make a small modification to it. It corresponds to using a Q which is not the volume in that region. Oh, incidentally, using the volume, using the volume as I did over here is called the scale factor time cutoff. It's called the scale factor time cutoff, and this is the scale factor time measure. Okay, instead of that Q, we're going to ask what is the number of Hubble patches, the number of Hubble size patches, and we're going to take out and put back an equal number of Hubble size patches. How big is a, well, how many Hubble size patches are there in a volume V? Volume V divided by the volume of a Hubble patch. The volume of a Hubble patch is inverse H cubed, right? Inverse H cubed. So, the number of Hubble patches in a given volume is just V times H cubed. That's if we're in the outer vacuum, the ancestor vacuum. If we're in the bubble, it becomes the volume, well, this we could call this the takeout volume. The thing we're putting back is the putback volume times little h cubed. Okay? So we're not conserving volume in this case. We're conserving the product of volume times Hubble cubed. That corresponds to keeping track or, uh, or to conserving the number of Hubble volumes. It has a certain niceness to it, in particular for people who like to think about DSCFT, the number of Hubble volumes is really thought of as the number of lattice sites or the number of cutoff volumes in the, uh, in the uh, field theory. So it has a natural uh, interpretation. What does it do? It simply changes it changes this equation over here. Instead of equating this to this, we equate h cubed to this, h cubed, h cubed. That has a small, makes a, a relatively small change in, in, the, uh, in the logic here. You can still work it out, easy to work out. And what it does is it changes the power of h here. It pulls down into the denominator three powers of h. It's that same three powers there. Track it through, and you'll discover it pulls down three powers of h. If I ever succeed in finding why there's, an x, why there's two powers of h upstairs instead of one, what it would do would bring down one power of h downstairs. So the, the light cone time measure is very similar, but it has a power of little h downstairs. That makes it more singular at, um, at small cosmological constant. In fact, it's not integrable as a function of h. There's a logarithmic divergence, and it suggests that, uh, that the answer may be close to whatever the smallest h is in the landscape. I'm not advocating this, incidentally. I'm simply telling you or reporting uh, what kind of things are out there in the literature. There's another game. Instead of weighing uh, q according to the number of Hubble patches, you might weigh, weigh q according to the number of bits of information. This is the number of Hubble patches. How much information is there in a Hubble patch? It's the Desider entropy. The Desider entropy is 1 over h squared. And so another game you could play that we call information measure is just conserving v times h equals v, v takeout times h is v put back times uh, little h. That conserves on the uh, surface here the number of Hubble patches times the number of degrees of freedom in each Hubble patch. And the effect of that would also be minor. I think it puts, I think it makes it less singular at small h and differs by two powers of h, so there would be an h upstairs. Am I right? Is that right? I think I have it right. Yeah, okay. Uh, so scale factor gives you an h squared. Light cone time gives you a 1 over h. Information gives you uh, an h in the numerator. 
The numerator is nice because it cuts things off here. But it's, why the scale factor time measure? Why, the, why one, why the other? Nobody knows. There's no, uh, there's no particular logic to it. OK. Just uh, as a point, there are corrections due to the fact that when you integrate a bubble over space, there may be other bubbles around that you have to avoid, that you don't want to, uh, that you don't want to, to count the volume where uh, there's already a bubble present. And the effect of that is basically to change this 3 to a 3 minus epsilon, where epsilon is a certain fractal dimension of, uh, of, the, uh, of the inflating portion of the universe. Uh, but that's epsilon, if the decay rate is small, epsilon would be a small number. And it would be the, uh, the fractal dimension of the parent universe, that the, 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 the fractal dimension of the inflating portion. All right, but that's, that's uh, not a big deal. I don't think that changes anything, anything significant. Another point, now this is your homework. Your homework is to modify all of these models, all three of them, with the following added ingredient. We change the model a little bit. And here's what we're going to do. Our original model for a bubble nucleation is to say a Big Bang occurred. Observers form after time t naught. Now we're going to add something onto the bottom here. And the thing we're adding is an era of slow roll inflation. Slow roll inflation, we're going to continue to think of t naught now as the time from reheating. Think of it as the time from reheating and add n sub e e foldings of slow roll inflation and see what that does. I'm going to tell you what it does, but uh, this is for you to prove. It does nothing. It doesn't change the answers at all. You might think it has a dramatic change in the answer because it inevitably pushes the nucleation point down. Keeping everything else fixed, it'll push the nucleation point down. And if you push the nucleation point down, then you have less volume to sweep out. I'm not going to tell you what the, uh, what the gimmick is, which winds up canceling that factor exactly. Okay? So it's interesting that this particular mechanism does not weigh different number of e-foldings. It doesn't prefer large number of e-foldings. It doesn't prefer large, large volumes. It just cancels out. It's thought of as a probability for the number of e-foldings, it's flat. Now, of course, you should add into this the prior, the counting in the landscapes of different kinds of vacuums, different kinds of inflationary plateaus, and how many are there for given values of the uh, number of e-foldings. That should go in as a prior. And so that would say that uh, the only thing in the measure that depends on the number of e-foldings would be the counting of vacuums with different numbers of e-foldings. But no dramatic preference for large number of e-foldings. I think that's a healthy thing. OK, any questions? Yeah, uh, yes, but, uh, but it can be corrected. And it's corrected by taking the 3 to 3 minus epsilon. Uh, the reason it only works for sparse bubbles is because when you do the integral over space, you're supposed to avoid any other bubbles which are there. Yeah, I mean, you have to, you have to exclude the, uh, you know, some sort of excluded volume assumption. But uh, if the bubbles are sparse, then all it does is uh, turn the 3 into 3 minus epsilon. OK. I'm not sure how much time we have, but I'll uh, talk a little bit more about some ideas. That, uh, that we've been thinking about on and off for the last five years or so at Stanford. Um, 
Everybody that I know that thinks about this and tries to keep track of the statistics always has in the back of their mind some sort of imaginary observer who keeps track and keeps records of the number of things, the number of different things. Some sort of imaginary observer, one who thinks about um, uh, DSCFT, likes to imagine that, this, that what is this DSCFT good for? It's a quantum mechanics of a global universe. Nobody within the global universe can measure things outside uh, causal patches and so forth. Who is it that gets to use the quantum mechanics on scales bigger than the, uh, than the horizon size? Who is it that gets to keep, the, keep records? Who gets to compare those records with the statistical, uh, the statistical uh, probabilities? Who is it that can measure correlations? You know, Juan spent uh, an hour calculating correlations in De Sitter space on scales bigger than the horizon. Now, that, of course, it would be useful if what we were talking about was the transition of slow roll inflation to, uh, through reheating, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about eternal inflation, and nobody ever gets to see the world on scales bigger than the, uh, than the horizon size. So a fictitious observer who keeps track of all the numbers uh, that the, the statistical probabilities inherent in the wave function is a fiction, right? I mean, it's clearly a fiction. Uh, in fact, if you imagine that there really was somebody out there, I don't know what to call him. Let's, uh, Juan just calls it the outside observer. The Olympian gods who sit on top of Mount Olympus watching us and counting all the things that we do of course, would have an effect. Any measurement done on a system in the quantum mechanics affects it. So the Olympian gods cannot really make measurements on our world without affecting it, and presumably uh, they don't affect it. So it's clearly purely a fiction. Alan Guth likes to call the observer who observes the entire multiverse, he calls it the multiversal archivist which is a mouthful for me, uh, the multiversal archivist. And these clings, as I said, are clearly fictions. Or are they? Could there really be a multiversal archivist? So I want to spend a few minutes talking about that, uh, which is kind of a different subject, but uh, never mind. The discussion begins by asking what under what circumstances? What are the conditions on a background? What are the conditions on a, uh, on a setup? Let's just call it a setup that you can expect infinite precision in your description. We would like to have a description of the world which is infinitely precise. Um, if there's some people who think it's okay to have a description, to not have, uh, it's okay to have a description which is not infinitely precise, but it's not okay if it's not possible to have an infinitely precise uh, description of something. And the reason is you know, you're completely out of control unless uh, you can make precise statements about something. Uh, the way I like to think about it is having an inherent degree of imprecision in a, that just can't be gotten rid of can be very dangerous. I think of it as being like Mathematics, um, is it okay to have a mathematical structure for which computers spit out theorems, endlessly spit out more and more theorems, and only one theorem out of 10 to the 20th is inconsistent? No, it's not okay. If a theory is inconsistent, it's just inconsistent, and uh, if you find one inconsistency, you can generate an infinite number of inconsistencies. I kind of worry that unless there's a backup that, uh, for, which, which, for which you can expect infinite precision, that the same thing will be true, that uh, you'll never be able to make any precise uh, statement. It's, it's not okay for, for a thing to be almost infinitely precise. That's my feeling. That's, my, uh, that's, that's what I think about this. So the question is then, when and under what circumstances does a particular setup, a string theory setup, or whatever it happens to be, allow infinite precision and when doesn't it? 
All right, so I know some, I, uh, some examples. Flat space. Flat space, we think, is, in, is infinitely well described by an S matrix. By flat space, I mean uh, string theory or quantum gravity in supersymmetric flat space. The only flat space theories I think are supersymmetric. There we have a lot of experience. There's every reason to believe that there does exist an S matrix, and that S matrix, there's no reason to think it's not infinitely precise. And so I would say flat space, including flat space with black holes. As long as you stay on the outside of the black hole and measure the S matrix, that I think potentially could be an infinitely precise description. ADS, ADS we do have a exact description of. It's in terms of boundary holographic description. Boundary degrees of freedom are the precise theory. The unprecise theory, the imprecise theory, is the bulk theory in the interior. That is not infinitely precise, but the boundary theory appears to be infinitely precise. What about the sitter space? Pure de sitter space now, DS. I would maintain that if there was such a thing, if there was, and there may not be, if there was such a thing as infinitely long-lived de sitter space, and by that I don't, mean, I don't mean eternal inflation. Eternal inflation has this property of exiting out into, uh, into terminals, but just real de sitter space, a potential which has a minimum which is positive and no other ways to leak out, for example, by having zero cosmological constant, then I would maintain that this is inherently imprecise uh, or that the best precision that can ever be gotten by an experimentalist inside the system, inside this world, the inherent imprecision is of order e to the minus the entropy of the de Sitter space. One simple way to think about it is to say in a de Sitter space which has a maximum number of bits which is S, or maximum number of states, which is e to the S, it's even impossible to write down a number which is more precise than, uh, than S digits. There's not enough, not enough bits available to write down a number which has more than 10 to the 120 decimal places. No, I think it's 2 to the 120, e to the 120 uh, decimal places. You know what I mean. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to think about things more precise than that. So there's an inherent limitation in the sitter space on precision, and so I would give the sitter space a failing grade on, uh, on precision, infinite precision. The question is, what backgrounds, what does this and this share that this doesn't share? Okay, and here's the speculation. I don't even know if it's a speculation. Maybe it's obvious. But uh, let's uh, see what the speculation is. Think of a geometry. This is the target geometry, meaning the thing that we want to describe. And it has a future boundary. The future boundary doesn't have to be space-like like this, but it has some future boundary. And let's look at a particular point on the future boundary and think about its past light cone, its causal patch. Rafael Busso is going to explain to you entropy bounds and entropy bounds are information bounds. Entropy is information, a uh, number of bits of information that it takes to describe a system. And generally speaking, well, there are rules for calculating the maximum entropy. They have to do with the maximum area as you move backward, maximum area of the horizon as you move backward along these light cones. But whatever it is, there's a maximum entropy, S max in there. Now, if S max is finite, it means uh, that uh, an observer in here cannot have an infinitely precise description. But now, imagine changing the point, moving it along the surface here, and let's maximize the maximum entropy, maximize it over all future points here. It can be that while many of these points have finite entropy bounds, 
that there are points in here which have infinite entropy bounds. If S max max is infinite, that's the situation where at least somebody in here has the possibility of having inf being able to say infinitely precise things. If there's some point in here where the backward entropy along the light cone here is infinite, then potentially an observer in there has enough bits, enough, uh, enough um, degrees of freedom to be able to make infinitely, re uh, infinitely precise uh, statements. This is a, a speculation, this is a uh, conjecture, but it fits together with everything we know. So let me give you some examples. Let me go back to these examples. Here's flat space. An observer in flat space looks back along his backward light cone, and of course, as time gets later and later, the area of that backward light cone gets bigger and bigger, and that observer, as time goes on, gets to see an infinite number of degrees of freedom, if you like, just because of the properties of flat space, and so flat space certainly satisfies this. So does flat space with a black hole, Flat space with a black hole, at least the observer who asymptotes to that point over there, t equals infinity, does look out, and his future light cone is also unbounded in entropy for the same reason. It's kind of interesting to think about people who happen to find themselves behind the horizon. Uh, if you use the precise rules of Bousseau's entropy bounds, you find that these people do not have infinite uh, entropy. I believe they're, they're bounded. Uh, you have to use uh, Gusso's wedges. You have to use the fancy version of it. But I, their ability to collect data is limited, and it's obviously limited. Uh, their causal patches get smaller and smaller, and obviously the amount of information in them is limited. And so I, I think it's probably true that trying that these people who live behind the horizon, no matter how big the black hole is, have a degree of imprecision that, uh, that cannot be uh, overcome. But as we scan across the future boundary, we do find places where, uh, where the information content is infinite. And it's from these places, from these platforms, let's call them, where it is presumably possible to have precise descriptions. What about ADS? ADS, it's also true. Here's, for those who know about ADS, this is R equals zero. This is R equals infinity. The area on the boundary of the sitter space is infinite. An observer at R equals zero looks out, and his backward light cone, the area increases and increases to infinity. So in principle, there can be an infinite amount of information in here. So at least according to the rule, according to the rule that the backward light cone has unbounded area in the Busso sense, uh, flat space and ADS would have precise descriptions. The sitter space would not, just because the backward light cone of the sitter space is bounded in area. All right, but now we come to the multiverse. Now we come to eternal inflation, and we ask, how about that case? So here's eternal inflation, and eternal inflation always ends with one, as far as we know, with a small number of possible kinds of exits out of the eternal inflation. One of them is bubbles with zero cosmological constant. Another one is crunches of various kinds, uh, just crunches of various kinds. We know very little about the crunches, in fact, uh, there are enormous puzzles about them. But the, these are called hats. The hats are the only places in here where an observer moving up toward the tip of the hat here looks back and sees an infinite amount of area in his past uh, light sheet, what's called a light sheet. The hats, as far as I can tell, are the only places in the multiverse where an observer can, in principle, have an infinite, store an infinite amount of, uh, of information. 
Now, there's some very subtle questions um, about whether observers really can continue to exist, whether they really can continue to record information. I'm going to ignore that. Okay, so let me, let me tell you what the idea that we're exploring. The idea of, that we're exploring, of course, is that this is Mount Olympus. This is where, uh, where the gods who, uh, who survey the entire multiverse live. They're the only ones who have enough information to be able to see an infinite, uh, an infinite multiverse. But is it reasonable to say that people who live inside or under this hat here can see what's going on out over here? So let me point out something to you that uh, I'm not going to spend, we're just about finished, but point out an odd and interesting fact. Let's draw our de Sitter space. And let's imagine at a very, very late time, I just make it a late time to illustrate visually a point, a very late time, one of these zero cosmological constant vacuums nucleate. If it's very late time, it looks extremely small. If you're in the back of the room, you probably can't even see it. Okay? In fact, it looks like a negligible perturbation on future infinity of the sitter space. You run it backward, and you ask how much entropy is in that backward light cone. Well, since it's such a tiny perturbation, it can't be significantly different than the de Sitter space itself. This is practically identical to the, uh, to the past light cone of a point in de Sitter space. But in fact, it's not true. It's not true. The entropy bounds within a hat are infinite. To see that, you just blow it up a little bit bigger so that you can see it. This is a flat space or an approximately flat space region here. And an observer living in here, a it may be a metaphorical observer, but uh, imagine an observer, looks back, and as he approaches the tip of the hat, the maximum area that he sees on his backward light cone gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually diverges. However, once these backward light cones enter into the de Sitter space, that area fairly rapidly goes back and tends to the area of one horizon size region of the sitter space. So as you move up here, the area increases, but then as you pass into the de Sitter region, it decreases. According to Busso's rules, the entropy available to be seen within the hat here, the number of degrees of freedom available to be seen by an observer up here is proportional to the maximum area of such a light sheet. And it doesn't matter that it, goes, uh, that it gets small after you pass out of this region. Another way to say it is this region here has photons coming into it. The photons keep coming in, they keep coming in, they keep coming in, and they come in endlessly. It is true that they get harder and harder to detect because they become more and more redshifted, and there is a question of whether it's possible to even design an observer who can uh, see more than a finite number of photons, but an infinite number of photons do come in closer and closer to here. Notice, incidentally, that if we were in de Sitter space, if this were a de Sitter bubble, it would terminate over here, and the observer would not be able to see an infinite number of photons. So this observer gets to see more and more photons, more and more entropy, and the amount of entropy vastly exceeds the amount that uh, the corresponding de Sitter space observer would have seen. What is all this extra entropy? The question is, what is all this extra entropy? I would say the first one, uh, the first one over h squared or h squared? One over h squared, this is the entropy of the background de Sitter space. The first one over h squared photons that come in that corresponds to the entropy of the parent de Sitter space, probably have very little information in them except what the de Sitter space uh, observer could have seen if it was just an ordinary de Sitter space observer. But the number of photons keeps coming in and coming in and coming in. Eventually, you vastly exceed 
the maximum entropy in the de Sitter space. What does all that information describe? And the only thing, it's not information in the backward light cone here. The maximum amount of information in the backward light cone, well, at least in the, uh, it, it's not information that would have been there in the de Sitter space, the pure de Sitter space case. It's something else. What is it? The only thing around that it could be is information from out here. Information in the rest of the multiverse, for, uh, basically. So we've been exploring for years now the idea that the radiation coming into here carries the infinite amount of information in the rest of the uh, multiverse. If that's true, if that idea, if this complementarity idea that radiation in here is complementary to what's out here, if that's true, then there does exist a natural cutoff. It's a natural cutoff available to an observer in here, looking out, you know, the gods on Mount Olympus, their natural cutoff is to draw a sequence of light cones back further and further and gather more and more information. They're gathering more and more information about what's going on out here. This has not been carried out. I'm simply telling you about what we've been thinking about, trying to map, let's call it the census taker's cutoff, into an information cutoff and counting things in the rest of the multiverse. At the moment, I'm not prepared to say that we know exactly what we're doing. Uh, there are some indications that this cutoff would produce something fairly similar to either the light cone time cutoff or the uh, information cutoff. But I thought I would just end up by telling you uh, what, uh, what I have been thinking about. Okay. That's it.